All right. Well, thank you all for uh, bearing with us for a moment. I, it all worked an hour and a half ago, so I, I don't know. Um, all right. So um, today it's my great delight to welcome Dan Matheson. So Dan Matheson is the director of the Sport and Recreation Management Program at the University of Iowa. Prior to joining the Iowa faculty, he worked as an NCAA Associate Director of Enforcement and as the New York Yankees uh, Director of Baseball Operations. And did you bring your rings? Just one. He just brought one of his <laughs> rings with him today. Okay. Um, he's frequently asked to provide uh, expert insights during media coverage of sport industry issues. I've seen him on like ESPN sometimes mm -hmm. and many other uh, uh, sources. Uh, including the ESPN's Outside the Lines, uh, the New York Times, and Sirius XM's College Sports Nation. In his teaching and other service to the campus, uh, Dan prioritizes connecting students with employers to network and get hands-on experience with real projects wherever possible. And I've seen firsthand how hard he works on behalf of students to build those connections. Through collaboration with the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Dan's developed a national interdisciplinary first-of-its-kind student sports law competition as well, the College Athletics Infractions Hearing Competition. This event gives students roles as NCAA enforcement staff and University Defense Council, and the University of Iowa group recently presented their cases to a panel of judges across the country during mock hearings at the end of February. Now, are you going to talk a little bit about that? Uh, I will if anybody has questions. About <laughs> All right. it, yeah. Anyone has any questions? So Dan's going to talk for about 50 about minutes, 40 about 40 to 50 minutes, yeah. um, and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions. So just give me a yeah. moment to get back up there, yeah. and let's welcome Dan Matheson. Thanks, Professor Rantan, and I'll, I'll give him a moment to get set up. Will you give me a thumbs up at some point? Oh. Good to go. All right. Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, it really, I, I will save time for questions and, and uh, look forward to uh, continuing this discussion that has been going on all semester in this speaker series that Professor Ranton has put together. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to, to keep the discussion going around this topic of name, image, and likeness. Uh, and so I'm going to start with a story and, t and stop me if you've heard this one before. Uh, a skier, a kicker, and an avatar walk into a bar together. And I'm, I can tell that you know where I'm going with this one. Uh, <clears throat> just kidding. My, my uh, inspiration for the, uh, uh, for the title of my presentation today was, uh, I've got to get my clicker. Uh, the, my title was inspired not just to grab your attention and try to get you curious about what I was going to talk about today, but also uh, was inspired by what uh, uh, I would argue is the path that led the NCAA into the name, image, and likeness era that we are in now. And that path uh, was cut by uh, the skier, uh, Jeremy Bloom, the kicker, Donald De La Haye, and, the, uh, and Ed O'Bannon, or more specifically his avatar uh, that appeared in the NCAA basketball uh, video game. Uh, and uh, California in 2019, as many of you know, passed uh, legislation that made it legal to uh, give student athletes name, image, and likeness uh, uh, monetization rights in the state of California. Many states followed California's lead and eventually in 2021 forced the NCAA to lift their uh, century old ban on uh, student athlete uh, name, image, and likeness rights. But what got elected officials to that point? And uh, you know, I'm intrigued by the question of how did state legislators who these days can't seem to agree on anything across party aisles all come together in this moment of harmony to agree to do battle against the NCAA over this issue? Uh, I would uh, argue that uh, we need to, that the answer to that question lies in the case study 
of the, the skier, the kicker, and the avatar, and the 20 years of momentum that was building up to 2019, when the California legislature felt it was important enough to step in and create new law in this space uh, that, that uh, uh, pushed the NCAA to finally start to modernize its amateurism rules. <clears throat> uh, so we're gonna look at uh, those issues. We're gonna talk about uh, what occurred over the 20 years of, of these three individuals and the, the NIL test cases that they presented to the NCAA and how the NCAA responded uh, and, and the strategy, the approach that they took in responding to uh, each of these individuals and their cases and where that uh, put them in 2019 and where they are now. We'll also talk about uh, what's next in the NIL space, what to watch for, and uh, maybe you know, some thoughts that I have about uh, the direction that the NCA should go in with some of its uh, new challenges that it's facing in the amateurism space. We'll get to all of that, but before we do, I wanna take just a moment uh, to spend a little time establishing some base level name, image, and likeness knowledge in the room. I don't want to assume that everybody in here uh, reads about and thinks about NIL as much as a sports law nerd like me. So uh, just to begin with, uh, NIL, when we talk about NIL, we're talking about uh, publicity rights for college student athletes. Uh, in some states, high school, uh, athletes also have name, image, and likeness rights, but it's the ability to uh, monetize those publicity rights while maintaining their eligibility uh, for college athletics. Uh, the, when we say that a student athlete has an NIL deal, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're saying that they've monetized their publicity rights in some way like uh, doing an autograph signing uh, in exchange for compensation, uh, uh, doing a commercial, uh, or what is most common in the NIL space, doing paid social media posts, uh, which is uh, a part of the majority of name, image, and likeness deals that student athletes are signing. Name, image, and likeness, likeness is a big deal uh, because uh, for more than a century, uh, the NCAA forbid student athletes from being able to monetize their publicity rights. And if we learned anything at the end of the first year of NIL, it's that uh, student athletes have left billions upon billions of dollars on the table uh, over the, the, the decades that they were uh, prohibited from accepting compensation for uh, their, their valuable NIL rights. <clears throat> uh, so with, uh, there's one other uh, area that I wanna uh, talk about is a little bit of background uh, for those of you that don't follow NIL that closely, and that's the idea of uh, collectives. Uh, the, the University of Iowa has a collective called the Swarm Collective. Co uh, collective, uh, as it relates to uh, the NIL space, is any time individuals or, or businesses pool their resources in order to create uh, essentially greater buying power in the NIL marketplace. Uh, collectives, while, while they do, uh, while they present themselves as, as uh, being affiliated in some way, or at least supportive in some way, like the Swarm being an Iowa collective and, and other collectives, uh, that are affiliated with or, or appear to be affiliated with schools, collectives cannot be run by schools or athletics departments. There, can't, uh, there has to be an arm's length relationship uh, between the two. Although there are lot, there's lots of speculation that some schools are too uh, closely entwined with their collectives, and we'll talk a little more about that uh, later. Uh, despite the fact that uh, collectives are, are, uh, cannot be part of the athletics department, and the athletics department can't prop up a collective on its own, uh, if in, in the current NIL space, 
if your school doesn't have an aggressive collective uh, supporting your recruiting and, and student athlete retention efforts, your school is considered to be behind the times uh, and at a competitive disadvantage when it comes to recruiting, uh, which is the lifeblood of uh, athletics and uh, retaining student athletes. And there are different ways that collectives can be formed. Uh, the swarm uh, is one example of a subscription membership uh, model, uh, same as the volunteer club here, which supports uh, the University of Tennessee student athletes. Collectives, uh, uh, this, this is a common form of collective. You know, they, they've got their membership uh, posted prominently there on their, their home website. And so just like you pay a monthly Netflix subscription, uh, you can pay monthly into a collective so that your subscription uh, fees are funneled towards NIL deals for, uh, in this case, Tennessee volunteer student athletes. And these collectives exist, I said to give greater buying power in the marketplace, these collectives exist, uh, in, generally speaking, to uh, support recruiting and, and uh, retention of student athletes once they've uh, uh, started as school. And uh, uh, there's no better example of that than the collective at Texas A&M, the Matador Club. Uh, last summer, uh, the, the Matador Club boldly proclaimed, we're giving a $25,000 base salary to every member of the football team, basically. Uh, that's, that's the type of behavior by collectives that uh, is being uh, criticized nationally, that, that has many in college athletics uh, screaming for the NCAA to crack down on perceived misuses of name, image, and likeness. There's a, uh, a common belief in college athletics uh, and in higher ed overall, that uh, NIL provides a lot of potential benefits for student athletes to be able to go out and legitimately uh, be entrepreneurial, uh, sign uh, deals for themselves, uh, but nobody anticipated the collectives when uh, NIL started and they quickly filled the NIL space and have become a significant player uh, in uh, name, image, and likeness transactions, and they're engaging in, in things that uh, are not what uh, members of the NCAA, uh, meaning schools, uh, athletics directors, conference commissioners, uh, want or believe uh, name, image, and likeness should be about. So a uh, little bit of background uh, on name, image, and likeness and some uh, uh, important issues of the day before we circle back now to uh, the first of the three uh, NIL test cases uh, that I wanna talk about uh, today as we uh, go back about 20 years to 2002 when Jeremy Bloom was a, a star football player at the University of Colorado. But he was a very unique two-sport athlete in that he was also an Olympic level skier. Uh, we haven't seen a two-sport athlete like that, and that presented a unique NIL challenge to the NCAA, uh, and nobody was even using the expression NIL back then. Uh, uh, he, was, he was interested in, in having uh, the right to monetize uh, himself for endorsement purposes. Uh, the, the issue, the challenge here for the NCAA for a dual-sport athlete like Jeremy Bloom is that they have rules that do allow you to be an amateur college athlete in one sport and a uh, professional athlete in a different sport. And a common example of that in uh, college sports is uh, uh, college football or basketball student athlete who plays minor league summer professional baseball and is paid a salary for playing baseball from their baseball team, uh, but uh, can go back to school in the fall and play football or basketball. The issue with a skier like Jeremy Bloom is that 
skiers don't uh, receive much in the way of prize money. They don't have a, a, a standard salary like a baseball player does playing minor league baseball in the summer. Uh, they derive the majority of their income from endorsements. And Jeremy Bloom had already been on the U.S. Olympic team in 2002, and then he was a, a freshman football uh, uh, player at, at Colorado uh, shortly after. And in order to get ready for the next Olympics, he wanted to start accepting endorsement money. Uh, his argument was that... Uh, uh, Skiers, uh, since since we need we rely on endorsements in order to train and uh, uh, travel and compete to get ready for world competition, I can only do that if I can accept endorsement money. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, the NCAA rules prohibited uh, any form of endorsements even if you were a professional in one sport. So even if you played minor league baseball in the summer and came back to play football in the fall for your school, you couldn't accept endorsement revenue. Uh, so that was an obstacle, but the NCA has a waiver process. And we're getting up, we're, we're getting to uh, a, a crossroads moment for the NCAA here. Uh, this was a very high profile case as it was unfolding in the early 2000s. And uh, the NCA has a waiver process that you can follow if uh, a school believes that uh, a rule should not be applied to a student athlete for a, uh, a certain reason. And so the uh, uh, University of Colorado applied for a waiver uh, and asked uh, the NCAA to uh, not apply its, its traditional uh, endorsement restrictions to Jeremy Bloom allow him to accept endorsements uh, related to skiing while keeping his football eligibility. Uh, his initial waiver was denied and uh, the NCAA has an appeals process uh, and his appeal of that waiver denial was also uh, denied. Uh, the NCAA, this is, this is that you know, a uh, crossroads moment that the NCAA was faced with, uh, they applied a very uh, strict uh, reading of the rules. And their, the, the NCAA's position at the time was that uh, this would create a slippery slope. If we uh, allow an exception in this case, what will be next? Uh, what sort of uh, creative uh, uh, end around uh, to get through the rules will, will the next student athlete uh, offer us. And so uh, the NCAA uh, uh, didn't want to start down that slope. They also, uh, the NCAA argued that, uh, you know, look, on that previous slide, when you see Jeremy Bloom in Tommy Hilfiger trunks, we don't know if that Tommy Hilfiger money is being given to him because he's a, a skier, because he's a football player, because he's a unique dual sport athlete, or just because he's a handsome guy, we don't know. Uh, we can't, uh, uh, since we can't discern what's related to football and what's not, and we're just not going to allow you to do it at all. Uh, and so uh, he was, he was uh, left with the decision, do I continue to play football uh, or do I give it up uh, in order to continue my skiing? I want to do both. And all the while, the public and uh, college sports public and uh, those beyond college sports followers were uh, watching this unfold. And Jeremy Bloom was not uh, content with the NCAA's decision. He uh, chose to sue the NCAA uh, in Colorado State Court. Uh, he was asking for injunctive relief so that he would be able to participate in football the, the, uh, in the 2004 fall season. Uh, and the NCAA uh, sought to defend the ability to uh, apply its rules as it saw fit and uh, to protect its uh, version of amateurism. Uh, the Colorado state courts sided with the NCAA uh, at trial and on appeal. Uh, the, N the, the court said, uh, that the NCA was not enforcing its rules in any sort of arbitrary manner. Uh, they were applying their endorsement rules uh, 
to Jeremy Bloom, the same as they do to all student athletes. And uh, their, this endorsement prohibition seems to have a rational relationship to uh, the NCAA's stated goal of uh, keeping college sports separate from professional sports. So uh, this was, uh, as I've uh, been building up to, the first of three uh, crossroads that the NCAA came to on its path to name, image, and likeness. Uh, Jeremy Bloom uh, caused the public to think, uh, many people in the public, to think for the first time about, uh, you know, are these rules fair? Does this make sense? Uh, and I want you to think back to 2004 when this decision came down. And at the time, uh, we had uh, professional athletes participating for the first time in the Olympics uh, within uh, about the past decade. Uh, we had the NBA Dream Team in 1992. Uh, uh, the uh, the Olympics had forever been uh, reserved for amateur athletes, and so there was there was a a uh, growing belief among uh, the the public and and uh, the sports community that uh, what's the problem or 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 why is there a problem with uh, am with an athlete who receives some uh, endorsement money participating in what's previously been thought of as amateur sports or uh, college sports. Uh, another issue that, that raised some of the questions, I'd say, in the, in the minds of the public, or at least planted the seed for what was to come, uh, was the idea that you know, the NCAA had become uh, much more professionalized in its marketing of its football and basketball product. And so uh, there was, uh, less support uh, or, or eroding support for the idea that student athletes, you know, must not receive any sort of uh, compensation outside of uh, their playing football. And also not insignificant in uh, the public's perception of Jeremy Bloom's case was uh, the 15 to 20 years or so leading up to his case where NCAA revenues and coaching salaries had really started to reach a level that, that no longer resembled anything having to do with higher education. Uh, by the time uh, Jeremy Bloom's case came about, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the highest uh, uh, revenue athletics department was bringing in over $100 million a year, uh, and the the average uh, salary for a football head coach was approaching a million dollars a year uh, at this point in time. And so th these were all issues that uh, when the NCAA dug in its heels and fought back against Jeremy Bloom and his effort to uh, ask the NCAA to think progressively about amateurism, uh, that, that caused the public to question. You know, what are we supporting here? Does this make sense? And, uh, you know, what direction is college sports heading in here when this young man uh, can't take advantage of these opportunities? So <clears throat> that's test case number one. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Ed O'Bannon. And you can see here on the screen, Ed O'Bannon on the left, uh, as he looked three-dimensionally in real life, and Ed O'Bannon on the right as his avatar appeared in a video game. Uh, Ed O'Bannon became the named plaintiff in a class action lawsuit against the NCAA that uh, continued this national discussion about name, image, and likeness rights. And, and the O'Bannon case was where college sports started to, uh, where, where you actually started to hear NIL. Uh, being thrown about. Uh, Ed O'Bannon, while he was a superstar college player, never really achieved the, the, what was expected of him professionally, and therefore about uh, 10 to 12 years after his professional career ended, 
he was selling cars in Las Vegas. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with selling cars in Las Vegas, but it certainly wasn't the trajectory that he was on as he graduated uh, from college and, and the expectations were that he would be a longtime NBA all-star. So uh, Ed O'Bannon became the face of uh, the first antitrust lawsuit challenging the NCAA's amateurism rules. Uh, the, uh, Ed O'Bannon represented the class of, of football and basketball student athletes that were suing the NCAA as well as their licensing company, CLC, and eventually EA Sports, uh, that was the producers of the very popular NCAA football and basketball games, uh, joined, uh, were, were joined as a defendant. Uh, the, the issue here, uh, as you can see from that avatar and Ed O'Bannon's uh, avatar on the previous screen, was that uh, the NCAA licensed its valuable brand assets to EA Sports. The, the logos, the colors, uh, even the uniform numbers, all to, for EA Sports to create this very lifelike game that really captured uh, the physical characteristics and mannerisms of players on court or on the field. The problem was the NCAA, uh, the EA Sports in their game never used player names. And the NCAA specifically, strategically withheld player names uh, from the video games. Uh, and at that point in time in the history of the NCAA, uh, student athletes, when they became a student athlete, had to sign a release that gave up their rights to uh, uh, their name, image, and likeness while they were a student athlete and beyond. So Ed O'Bannon, when he's being depicted in an NCAA video game 12 years after he graduated, and by that time he's selling cars and he's not getting the NBA paychecks anymore, he's realizing, wait a second, somebody's making money off of this and it sure isn't me. Uh, so that he became a, a, a very uh, sympathetic uh, lead plaintiff in this case and uh, a, a great vehicle for telling this story of why the plaintiffs were uh, suing the NCA here, uh, asking for NIL rights. <clears throat> so uh, as that case progressed, uh, the uh, EA Sports and CLC, they got themselves out of this case uh, before going to trial, they settled, uh, actually, a lot of student athletes from that era received paychecks from EA and the EA and CLC settlement. Uh, they discontinued the video game, uh, much to the chagrin of probably some of you in here. And uh, I, I know I've heard that complaint before. <clears throat> uh, but the NCAA, again, in another crossroads moment, said, no, we're going to trial. Uh, we're going to defend against uh, this unjust uprising uh, by student athletes. Uh, so uh, this case was heard in the Northern District of California, uh, which Judge Claudia Wilkins' courtroom has become uh, considered by many to be home court advantage for uh, plaintiffs in these cases against the NCAA, uh, starting with this O'Bannon case. Uh, Judge Wilkin agreed with the plaintiffs that the NCA was violating uh, antitrust law in uh, the use of its amateurism rules to keep student athletes from ever receiving any compensation uh, for their name, image, and likeness. And she uh, found that there would be two less restrictive alternatives that uh, to their traditional amateurism rules that would help bring the NCAA into compliance. The first of those being to allow uh, schools to provide full cost of attendance scholarships. And that led to uh, stipend checks for student athletes of usually about uh, between three and $6,000, depending on the school you're at, uh, to cover the full cost of attendance beyond what tuition, room, board, and books cost. So uh, that was viewed as still being educational expenses, but uh, a scholarship should be allowed to cover that. 
The second less restrictive alternative uh, to the amateurism rules in Judge Wilkins' eyes was $5,000 a year that each school should have to set aside for its football and student athlete, football and uh, basketball student athletes that they would receive upon graduation uh, as a compensation for the use of their NIL in broadcasts and video games or in uh, other such endeavors. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, the decision was appealed and in the Ninth Circuit, uh, the Ninth Circuit upheld uh, Judge Wilkins' first less restrictive alternative and said, yes, we agree. Uh, uh, full cost of attendance scholarships make perfect sense. Uh, we, do we do agree with Judge Wilkin that the NCAA is violating uh, antitrust law, uh, but full cost of attendance scholarships are all that's needed. The Ninth Circuit disagreed with Judge Wilkin's $5,000 a year uh, uh, trust fund to be created uh, and, and bestowed upon graduation. And the Ninth Circuit, I, I highlighted this language because this uh, became language that the NCA really latched onto. Uh, despite losing this case, the NCA said, but look, uh, they defended our belief uh, about amateurism uh, by saying that cash sums untethered to educational expenses would be a quantum leap that we are not going to take in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, the NCA saw that as a, uh, a small victory within a, a larger loss of uh, decision. Now, that language, I, I, I highlight that, and I want to go back real quickly uh, before we go forward, and I want to take you back briefly to a Supreme Court case in 1984 because there was other important language that the NCAA was, was relying on here uh, to believe that the judicial system supported its version of amateurism. Uh, in the uh, Board of Regents case that went to the US Supreme Court and was not about amateurism at all, it was about uh, the NCAA's strict control over broadcasting football games, uh, the court said, uh, most significantly highlighted there, in order to preserve the character and quality of the college sports product, athletes must not be paid. Between that and uh, in 1984 and the Ninth Circuit, uh, in many ways reaffirming that position by the uh, Supreme Court in 2015 in the O'Bannon decision, uh, the NCAA was emboldened uh, to continue to defend its uh, its version of name Im or its version of amateurism, and believe that it uh, still had solid ground from which to uh, 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 enforce its amateurism rules without interference by the courts, and that was you know that's really this this second crossroads moment that the, N the NCA came to along its journey to uh, name, image, and likeness where we are now. Uh, the Jeremy Bloom case was decided in 2004. The O'Bannon case gets filed just five years later, takes six years to uh, be litigated. And so you're talking about uh, a 11, 12 year period where uh, name, image, and likeness is really becoming part of uh, the national discussion and uh, sports fans, uh, media commentators, and uh, people within that worked and, and lived within the college sports space were, uh, had a growing awareness of uh, some potential issues of unfairness in the NCA rules and the way amateurism had always been applied. Uh, and I would also argue that uh, the O'Bannon case uh, at least helped spawn a couple of other uh, cases uh, many of you have probably heard about the Alston case that did end up going to the Supreme Court uh, back in 2021, uh, and that was another antitrust challenge to the NCAA's amateurism principles that went beyond just name, image, and likeness. Uh, that case was filed after the O'Bannon case, and Northwestern's football student-athletes uh, made an attempt after 
the O'Bannon case was filed to challenge uh, the notion that they could not be employees of their institution using the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, so uh, I would argue that if were it not for uh, the O'Bannon case being filed and uh, those plaintiffs having some early success, not getting dis uh, their case dismissed in the early stages of litigation, that uh, it, it encouraged other uh, potential plaintiffs to come forward. So we've come to two crossroads and uh, there's one more to go. And that is the kicker, Donald De La Haye. Uh, Donald De La Haye was a kicker at University of Central Florida, but he was also a budding YouTube content creator. Uh, he was, uh, he had a, a YouTube channel that had both non-football and football videos. Uh, and he was monetizing his channel through the advertising and subscription uh, numbers that he was uh, running. And <clears throat> uh, that created another Jeremy Bloom-esque uh, issue for the NCAA to deal with. And the University of Central Florida, just like Colorado, uh, applied for a waiver of uh, the usual uh, policies. And the NCA in this case granted a limited wa uh, waiver to uh, Donald De La Haye. They said, you can keep your YouTube channel up and still play college football, but you can't monetize football videos on your uh, platform anymore. And that uh, uh, presented uh, De La Haye with a, uh, a crossroads moment of his own and he decided uh, he was unwilling to accept that compromise. He gave up his scholarship, gave up his football career in order to pursue what was becoming a lucrative uh, 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 YouTube career. Um, the, this again, uh, in terms of keeping the issue of name, image, and likeness and fairness of uh, some of the NCA rules and how they're applied kept it front of mind uh, for many in the world of sports. And this was in 2017, uh, Donald De La Haye's case was being dealt with, again, just two years after the O'Bannon case had been decided. Uh, so uh, we're, we're towards the end of this 15 to 20 year period of time where uh, the public is really starting to question, what's the NCA doing here? And does this make sense? Can we support this any further? And that's where just two years after Donald De La Haye, you see California uh, legislators step in and say, uh, you know, we don't see the courts able to resolve this to our satisfaction. We need to step in and create new law. And uh, California led the way, created the Fair Pay to Play Act that uh, basically prevented the NCAA from being able to enforce its name, image, and likeness restrictions on athletes at California schools. Uh, and you, can, you know, I, I've been talking about each of these NIL test cases uh, that the NCAA faced along the way, building up growing frustration. Uh, and when you read uh, California Senator Nancy Skinner's comments here, she was a co-author of this uh, legislation, you can see uh, and, and feel the frustration, I'm sure in the constituents uh, that she talked with, uh, in, in everything that she learned as she was researching and writing this uh, piece of legislation, uh, she uh, reflects uh, where society was at uh, at the point in time that California was ready to step in and force the NCAA uh, to, to uh, modernize its, its amateurism rules. <clears throat> so uh, I want to transition out of uh, the historical context into uh, a little bit of discussion of what's coming in name, image, and likeness, what to be on the lookout for uh, as we go forward, and uh, some thoughts about 
what's coming next for the NCA in terms of its next big legal challenge to amateurism. Uh, one area that I would encourage you to uh, monitor and keep an eye on is enforcement. Uh, we, we are now almost two years into the NIL era, and there's essentially been no uh, infractions cases involving name, image, and likeness. However, there have been dozens upon dozens of uh, popular media stories about situations that on their, on their face really look like violations of NCA rules involving name, image, and likeness. So uh, there's growing uh, 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 a, a cry that's, that's uh, uh, coming out among those in college athletics for the NCA to start enforcing rules. Uh, I have the Cavender twins up there because yes, there has been one infractions case involving the Cavender twins at Miami, uh, uh, and it's it's NIL related, but it really isn't the bombshell NIL case that everybody's waiting for. Uh, it's really just about a coach introducing them to a booster. <laughs>So enforcement is one area to keep an eye on. Another uh, thing to watch out for is uh, the NCA spending a lot more time on Capitol Hill. In fact, this week, Charlie Baker, the new president of the NCA on the bottom there, is uh, scheduled to testify before a congressional subcommittee, uh, asking Congress once again for some form of national NIL law. Uh, there are three big areas that the NCA has been asking uh, Congress to help out with. One is a national NIL law. And I do think that uh, there's potential for them to start to gain some traction in that space. Nothing's happened, and they've been going to Capitol Hill for three years now, asking for uh, something to resolve this area uh, and haven't been able to get any, any meaningful movement on it. Uh, Charlie Baker, uh, former governor of Massachusetts, now president of the NCA, he's trying to reframe uh, the issue of a national NIL bill as a consumer protection issue. He's arguing that student athletes uh, and their families are being uh, taken advantage of by uh, collect, uh, uh, collectives and brands that have an advantage over them. And we need to level the playing field with a uniform NIL contract and, and other forms of protection for uh, student athletes that, and their families that reside in the states that you govern. So uh, we'll see if that uh, helps move the needle at all on the NIL issue. Uh, two other areas that the NCAA has asked for is a law that would declare student athletes to be non-employees and a limited antitrust exemption. I don't see Congress doing anything on these two issues. Uh, I'm, I'm not expecting much movement, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, a couple of thoughts that I wanna share with you uh, having to do with what should the NCAA have learned from the last 20 years dealing with uh, uh, the name, image, and likeness test cases presented by uh, 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 Jeremy Bloom, Donald De La Haye, and Ed, Ed O'Bannon. Uh, the NCAA is in the position it's in now, scrambling uh, for relevancy because they just kept fighting against uh, some more progressive form of amateurism and ultimately had it forced upon them. And so, uh, I, you know, as I think back, what if the NCAA, when Jeremy Bloom presented this unique set of circumstances, what if they had started the dialogue? What if they had said, you know, let's start talking about what rules would look like uh, that we could pass, that we could be in control of before uh, lawmakers or courts step in and resolve it for us? Could they have created some uniform NCAA uh, rules that they would be responsible for? Could they have avoided uh, some of the lawsuits that came down in the past 20 years uh, that, that 
really put the NCAA in a, uh, in a bad position trying to defend uh, its views on amateurism. Uh, I would also, in, in this, with this idea of trying to get ahead of the next big issues to come along, uh, I, would, I would hope that the NCAA would recognize that, uh, they, that as times are changing, what they've historically relied upon uh, in, in terms of the courts having protected their version of amateurism has gone away and they, they can't rely on the courts to side with them any longer. And I think they've come to that realization after the Alston case uh, and the nine nothing defeat that they experienced in the Supreme Court there. Um, but the next big issue that I would encourage the NCAA to get out ahead on is this challenge of uh, student athletes uh, asking to be defined legally as employees. And they're using different strategies, uh, uh, working through the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, we've got plaintiffs uh, using the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, to challenge uh, the, the fact that they've always been labeled as non-employees. And uh, my recommendation, not that the NCA is looking for it uh, or is going to do anything uh, related to this, but what I'd really love to see is uh, for the NCAA to engage in some form of dialogue uh, that might look like collective bargaining with their athletes uh, to, in much the same way that the NBA does with their Players Association, NFL, Major League Baseball, sit down around the table with their athletes, help them understand uh, what the legal and economic challenges would be to uh, uh, paying you something above and beyond uh, your scholarship. Uh, but if, if there's anything that we should have learned from the skier, the kicker, and the avatar, it's that fighting against uh, uh, certain change and having it forced upon them uh, down the line is only going to lead to uh, more pain and challenges for the NCAA and uh, potentially uh, lead to the organization uh, no longer existing. Uh, we'll have to see. I, I, I know that there are many challenges that, to doing the things that I recommend, and part of that is the hundreds of different schools and administrators and conferences that uh, just want to keep fighting this fight uh, that, that student athletes cannot be employees in their minds. Uh, with that, uh, I'd love to continue the dialogue if there are any questions. I know we don't have a lot of time remaining, but uh, appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Any questions? Awesome. Yeah. Um, talk about like defining the significance. Mm -hmm. You know, these groups of businesses that are uh, sometimes paying athletes just like it's like you said a base salary. Mm -hmm. I know it's a big deal when like the swarm got hurt threats to kind of give a personal endorsement and like telling football boosters, hey, maybe you should start donating here instead. Mm -hmm. I know that's a big deal across many collectives, coaching endorsements for both football and, and uh, basketball specifically, is that not considered like the school endorsing um, these collectives when they're getting their coaches to do it? Yeah, th th that's like up to the line, you know, so so there is a line there, you know, you wouldn't, uh, Coach Ference wouldn't be able to, uh, to bring a student athlete on his recruiting visit and introduce him to the, the head of Swarm and say, hey, I think, you know, this would be a perfect relationship. Uh, here. So uh, they, they, Iowa actually uh, takes a pretty conservative approach to supporting its collective, uh, as you're probably well aware. Uh, and, and actually the head of the collective, uh, the Swarm Collective, has been uh, openly critical in the news media of the Iowa Athletics Department. Uh, when, I, when I say that, it's about uh, some collectives are getting support from their athletics department, like in the form of uh, the athletics department giving the collective their season ticket holder list. 
in order to reach out to, uh, allowing the collective to set up uh, 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 information tables and booths right on the concourse in the stadium, or just having a larger presence uh, that feels more within the team, but not running the collective. So, very perceptive question. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, if you if we did go towards something like collective borrowing with student athletes, do you see that as something that would start out you know, as a as a low baseline, whether it's twenty thousand a year or something like that, or do you see it moving in a direction like towards revenue sharing or actually getting like a piece of the pie? Yeah, you know that's why. Uh, my, in, in my uh, imaginary world, I think of, you know, if you get football and basketball student athletes who arguably could say, look, you know, I'm worth $500,000, you know, pick your great football or basketball student athlete. But if you get them around the table with their fellow student athletes in gymnastics or track and field or swimming and diving, and you you educate them on you know Title IX is still a federal law that as a university we uh, must comply with whether you agree with it or not, and so once you understand some of the economic and legal issues that that we would face, uh, what would be reasonable? You know, let's accept the fact that the starting quarterback at Clemson isn't going to get paid what he's worth, but uh, if it allows us to uh, give you more than you're currently receiving uh, and sustains college athletics uh, legally under Title IX and other laws, then isn't that better for everyone? And I, I feel like there's, there's a middle ground there that uh, would satisfy large numbers of student athletes. Also uh, would, you know, going back to this idea of fighting back against public perception, it would help the public recognize that, okay, the NCA is, is making uh, legitimate steps towards the middle. Uh, all they've ever seen the NCA do is say, we know what's best, uh, don't question it, uh, we can't afford to pay you, and you know, if, you, if you got a dollar more than uh, uh, what your scholarship calls for, the whole system would crumble. And uh, the NCA has got to get beyond that narrative. Uh, that's a losing narrative. And uh, whether it's next year or 10 years from now, uh, they're going to end up with employees and having to figure out now how do we deal with this. I was wondering what's stopping these conferences from just breaking away from the NCA. It seems like the SEC and the Big Ten like, have the desire to pay their athletes and do all these things, but they're just not because this figure is telling them not to, why aren't they just leaving? Well, you know, they need to know what they'd be leaving for. And, you know, yeah, they, they could maybe play lots of great games between the, the Big Ten and the, the SEC, but there is some probably some perceived value to uh, all of these teams across the country were, were part of this uh, very large college athletics ecosystem that gives us access to this uh, tournament that everybody's watching, you know, this month. And and uh, uh, not that they couldn't just take football and move outside, because that has been proposed. Uh, there, there has been discussion about, you know, does football end up moving outside of the NCAA, football at the highest level of Division I, um, and just break off and become something of its own and then all other sports continue to be administered by the NCA. There, there's, it's still too early to know, uh, but it's, it's not impossible that they will end up somewhere close to what you're thinking about. Uh, there could become a fourth division, uh, you know, a division of division one that becomes a new division where there are much greater benefits to student athletes, and maybe it's only 65 teams or uh, some smaller number. Uh, not all of Division I wants to go in that direction. Um, so wait and see. I don't think it's that far-fetched, uh, but it probably wouldn't become like the Big Ten going out and just becoming a barnstorming league. Uh, that's got to, they still want to set up a, a meaningful schedule with teams around the country.
So we are unfortunately out of time. So